All right, well, let me first get started, and I want to say thank you to every single person who is here. My name is Kia Jackson, and I am the founder of the Black Experience in Cannabis. We are extremely excited to have a plethora of people from around the world. We have people from Jamaica and all the way from Oregon, from Florida, from Detroit, from Louisiana, and a very unique, eclectic crowd. If you have the opportunity, please engage and interact with these people. The purpose of this event is to impact and to educate. I really feel strongly about uh, collective responsibility and cooperative economics within the African-American global community. Though we make up less than 1%, this is an opportunity for us to build and develop resources so that we can bring together knowledge from around the world that different people have and bring it into one place so that we can be our own resource of greatness. We're going to get started with the presentation. Our mistress of ceremony is Dr. Shonda Macias. She is the owner and manager and the second woman of color to open a dispensary right here in Washington, D.C., named National Holistic Healing Center. And Dr. Macias also is the chairwoman for the organization Woman Grow. Her list is extensive, and I will now call her up to begin emceeing. And thank you again. Thank you again for allowing me to be here. Um, this is very important. This is the first event that we've been able to have our presence here at the Congressional Black Caucus. So I would like to thank Kia again for this endeavor. It's huge, it's monumental for our community. So. So when you give the statistic that I am less than 1% of owners in the cannabis industry, that is very sad for our community. And I will say that, that this is an issue for our community because it's also a new pioneering industry mm -hmm. that is very lucrative for those that are engaged. And yet, because of issues within the war of drugs that we're gonna discuss today, or some other experiences that we've had with the medical marijuana or the recreational um, cannabis um, world industry, that we are hesitant to engage. And I will tell you that as a woman of color, um, two-time Howard University graduate with a PhD, <laughs> an MBA from Rutgers University, that I am still one of two black women who have been licensed to operate a dispensary in the entire nation United States of America. And I appreciate the accolades, but truly for me, this is a point of um, sadness to be blunt about it. I feel like that with this education, I feel like with the people in this room and outside of this room, that that number should be increased significantly. This is the new pioneering, we call it the green industry, a billion dollar industry, and yet we don't have engagement in the black community. It's going to happen, and if we take the proper percussions and create, go around our barriers to success, our community can actually grow for, from this endeavor. So let me start about briefly what I experienced once I got into this industry. I entered a room full of white men, and the first question was, how did you get here? And I said, I applied, just like everyone else did. Well, what made you different from everyone else that tried to apply and they selected you? And I said, hold up. I'm an educated woman. I've launched billion dollar brands. I have patents. I have publications in cancer research. I am the epitome of my community. 
but yet you can be a grower from California with not one inkling of education and you question my presence in this community? That's a hurtful thing for us, to question our presence in this community. There was one black grower that said, Shonda, I will sell you what I have to actually supply your dispensary because the other nine suppliers refused to let me sell their products. Wow. And I can't say with a doubt or with any hesitation that it was, you know, I question, well, was it me as a woman? Was it me as a black man? But what I could, black woman, but what I can say is in fact, the rest of the owners had supply and I didn't. And what made me different from them? So again, with the lack of having resources in this community, the industry, period, and having those networks, one other grower said, after three months, I had two strains and my patient count was low. He said, well, but you're growing. I said, yes, I'm growing. But how many dispensaries across the United States have two strains and think that they're going to have a robust patient population? And with that, another grower said, well, I'll sell you 10 strains, but I'm going to sell it to you at $6,500 a pound Ooh. when the going rate is $3,500 a pound at that time, but you have to buy all 10 pounds. Ooh. And I said, well, how can I do that? And what they said, that is not our issue. So what did I have to do as a black woman? I had to mortgage my house. But I will tell you today that even though the odds were set against me, we are the number one dispensary in the nation's capital today. Today, we have overwhelming market share. My partner, Attorney He's Drew done. Carter, thank you. Again, top of the line. Thank you, I appreciate it. Top attorney in the District of, Community, uh, District of Columbia. Again, Harvard graduate, Xavier graduate, and he stepped these steps with me. We just don't understand. And what we're going to do today is introduce the different businesses and their experience in this community, because this is some information we need to share. We encourage the people in this room to embark on this journey. And how were we doing it? Well, as Kia said, I stepped up as chairwoman of Women Grow, one, because I'm a woman. If I think about the statistics of women in this industry, it's less than 26%. Hmm. Then that was enough because, believe it or not, before I'm a woman, I'm a black woman. Minorities always consider their color first and then their gender second because our obstacles are different. And as a black person, I joined the board of the Minority Cannabis Business Association, so in fact, we could have a voice on the national scale. Pulling in other organizations and pulling in all our resources together collectively at a community, this is our experience. We hope you enjoy it, and I hope you're ready to hear these next set of panelists. Hiba Sadiq, please come up. Ms. Dashida Dawson. Cassandra Federi. And Jeff Doctor. They will give you brief presentations on their journey. And then we're going to have a brief question and answer. And then the next set of panelists will come up. So there will be a brief three-minute intermission with the panelists, but we're going to have them go ahead and introduce themselves, starting with... Um... Hi, I'm... Hello.
Hello? Are you locked? Hi, I'm Hiba Siddiqui, Chief Strategist at Consult DC. I was introduced to cannabis and hemp, well hemp particularly, 50, about 50 months ago, working with Kyla from Get Hemp Butter. And every month, as I drove and understood more about the business, helped her devise her business plan, I learned so much about the properties that I didn't understand why it wasn't being used everywhere. And so at Consult DC, I work with startups and small businesses, help them build their business plan, help them build the strategic direction for where they're trying to go, and show them how to incorporate cannabis into their business through different methods, whether it's in the product that they manufacture, the service they offer, or whether it's through the way that they go about their work. And so I'm happy to share with you today the history of cannabis. All right. Good evening, everyone. How are you guys? My name is Dashita Dawson, and I am the weed head. I'm a corporate to cannabis crossover and the founder, CEO, and president of MJM Strategy, the industry's first minority-owned strategy and management consulting company in the cannabis industry. We're the McKinsey of marijuana, I like to say. Um, and uh, today, I really am excited to share with you what, after we share a bit of the history, we'll focus a little bit on how the industry is shifting and what we're doing to do that. Our mission is to uh, legitimize, to stabilize, and to diversify the cannabis industry. And I believe strongly that we are the new faces of cannabis. So we'll show you a bit of that. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cassandra Frederick. I am the New York State Director at Drug Policy Alliance. Drug Policy Alliance is a national organization working to end the war on drugs. We are the only advocacy organization that has been involved in every successful ballot initiative in the country to legalize marijuana. We, are, we have been working on marijuana reform advocacy for the last 20 years, even up to the 1996 medical marijuana law in California. We are an organization that has um, offices in California, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, New Jersey, New York, and Washington, D.C. We um, also have worked to do marijuana reform around the, um, around the world. So we were the advocacy organization that worked to legalize marijuana in Uruguay um, and also provided support in Guam. So today I'm going to give a brief history of some of the history around marijuana reform policy um, and just in general what are the things that we're seeing in order to not only talk about uh, the criminalization associated with marijuana but the larger conversation around the criminalization of all drugs and how it's impacted um, communities of color and particularly black people. Saigos, Kanagoa. Um, that means hello, how are you? My name is Jeff Doctor. I'm from the Seneca Nation, originally outside of Buffalo, New York. I'm the executive director of the National Indian Cannabis Coalition, which is based here in Washington, D.C. Uh, our organization has been in, in, um, been in existence for over three years now. We formed this uh, organization to represent Native American tribes here in the United States, and also uh, we represent some tribes in Canada. Um, I've been involved in the cannabis industry since 2013. Um, I've been doing state licensing uh, around the country, um, working on state license, acquiring them in different states for a bunch of years. And when I saw what happened in the Department of Justice in the end of 2014, um, beginning of 2015, allowing Native American tribes to be able to get into the cannabis space, we, we created this national organization to give a voice to Native American tribes from all around North America. Um, I'm, also been involved in politics. I ran for United States Congress in 2010 in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I lived for 15 years as well. Um, so I have a, a little bit of understanding of the political dynamics here in DC. Um, I also have, I do some work um, in Canada with a, a, a company, which I'll get into a little bit uh, later. I do, I've done a, a licensing procedure in the country of Columbia in the last year. So um, my, I'm pretty diverse in, in where we've been going around the world as Native people. And I look forward to sharing some of my experiences and, uh, and hoping that uh, we reflect and be able to help in the cannabis space as well. So thank you.
So I'm just going to ask um, a brief question. And actually, Jeff, since you just left, can you tell me um, what are some of the challenges that the Native Americans face in the cannabis, cannabis industry? Sure. Certainly. Um, like, it's, um, the biggest thing when, I, when we go out and speak, so part of what we do for the National Cannabis Coalition, we go out and speak to tribal communities. And one of the biggest uh, issues is the stigmas that go along with our Native communities. And with any minority community, we, we have a lot of those stigmas that are the same. And we do a lot of education in the form of, there's even some tribal members that don't even understand what the difference in hemp is, what the different, is, the different parts of the cannabis plant is, what, what it really means to be involved in the cannabis industry. So one of our forms is we really try and go out and, and do education and make people aware of what the true opportunities are out there, what the possibilities are, what it takes to be involved in the cannabis space. And, and that's one of our, our, our first and foremost goals is to be able to educate and make sure that people understand what they're getting into we try and give them the pros and cons of, of what's happening in the industry and really just give them true information to those uh, community members. That's interesting. So just to talk about the education behind that, Cassandra, I know that you're definitely um, a champion on the war on drugs and how it's affected the black community. In terms of what you have done, all your pioneering work in New York, can you just give us a brief synopsis of what that looks like? Yeah. So I think one of the things that uh, we work at at Drug Policy Alliance is really giving people the history of how drugs became illegal. Um, I think oftentimes people, when they're thinking about drugs, including um, drugs like heroin and LSD um, and uh, marijuana, folks don't realize that the drug laws and policies associated with drugs are more likely to be associated with the face of the dominant user population than it ever has to do with the pharmacology of the drug. And that is actually the major thesis of a book called The Legislation of Morality that was written by Dr. Troy Duster, who was a black man who wrote the book in 1969 based on 100 years of drug war policies. So before Richard Nixon even declared the war on drugs, a black man wrote a book that talked about how race is the determining factor in the laws that we create around drugs. And so oftentimes, the work that we're doing in trying to remove criminal penalties associated with drugs is really about getting people to understand that the reason why these drugs are illegal in the first place has everything to do with social control, xenophobia, and racism. And that, that is in no small part why our policies have to do as much as possible to disrupt those institutions, right? And so I think as we even, in this conversation, there are a lot of people that are involved in the industry. Even the fact that people are using the word cannabis over marijuana is political, right? There is this belief that using the word cannabis sanitizes the conversation that we're a part of. There's even this idea that using the word marijuana is racist, when marijuana actually means cannabis in Spanish. And if you look even more into the etymology of the word, it means hops in Japanese. But part of the reason why they used the word marijuana was because when they were criminalizing that substance, they wanted to associate it in the Southwest with Mexicans. And that is what they called it. So therefore, they created the xenophobic kind of racist propaganda around our policies based on changing the word. Right? And so in this moment, as we are, you know, people that are in policy and people that are in the industry are trying to get to a place where it is legitimized and that people can take us seriously, we want to go back the other way, right? Which is part of the whitewashing of the history in the first place, right? So just, just to be very clear that we have to be very um, conscious and strategic about how we move in this space, because if we are not, then we are going to leave the foundation of how they made this drug illegal in the first place um, still present for whatever they do next, right? Because no matter what we do, they will try to figure out a different way to criminalize communities of color, particularly black people. And so if we can't walk, if we can't drive, if we can't be in our own apartment without getting slaughtered by law enforcement, then we have to understand that whatever we're doing to move forward around drug policy has to disrupt the very um, essence of how we got here in the first place. And so 
this conversation is really about figuring out how do we create a new industry in a way that disrupts the very reasons why this industry wasn't present in the first place. And so what that work looks like for me in New York is understanding that any industry that comes up, any conversation that comes up about the legalization of a substance also disrupts the kind of institutional power that is built by law enforcement. And also understanding that it's not just the fact that people are getting arrested for marijuana, it's the fact that people are getting deported for marijuana. It's the fact that people are losing their housing. It's the fact that people are getting their kids taken away. It's the fact that people are banned from their licenses. Um, it's the fact that people are being banned from the industry because of their prior history of being involved in an illicit market. And so part of the conversation that I'm hoping for as we talk about the black experience is that just because someone is a part of a legal market like um, the cannabis industry right now does not impede the fact that you are black, does not impede the fact that you will still remain to be criminalized. So this conversation about us moving into an above ground market cannot be built on this idea of the talented 10th or respectability politics, that the people that deserve to be in the industry are not just the people that manage to avoid the criminal justice system, but it's also the people that were in the criminal justice system for this substance. And so really hoping to really get into how history should inform the way that we move forward. Wow. <laughs> And right before we get started, Dashida, I need you to say, based upon what Cassandra just said, how dare you enter the cannabis space? So with that being said, what is your strategy in terms of business to be able to help people actually enter, knowing all these barriers? Well, I don't know if my mic is actually working. Um, but what I would say is that the biggest uh, strategy that I have been um, leveraging has been rebranding uh, cannabis. And so um, I'm not in full agreement about the nomenclature. I'm a molecular biologist. And so when you are a scientist, you, you do want to lean towards the scientific terminology. And cannabis sativa is, in fact, what this is, uh, um, is called. Um, and when we talk about that, then we can start talking about hemp, and we can start talking about, about marijuana, and we start really um, peeling away the layers. So I've been really focused on using real science, not bro science, right? <laughs> using real science um, and technology to help rebrand the cannabis industry um, through uh, marketing and strategy. Ultimately, an educated consumer is gonna be your best consumer. It doesn't matter what industry you work in. I come from a background where I, I like to joke a lot and say I went from Target to THC because I used to be an executive for Target. Um, if you're wearing any of the clothes from Target, if you're buying anything from Car Target, if you have any natural hair products from Target, that's all me, and, and, and the work that I did. So I've been used to being in industries where we had to relearn. People used to straighten their hair, relax their hair. We had to relearn how to love our hair as it is, and we became our best consumers, which is why that industry is booming. Similarly, we will need to do the same thing here in the industry, and so that's what I'll be talking more about. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so Heba, now it's your turn to talk about what your strategies for your business locally here in Washington, D.C., and overall? My strategy for Consult D.C. is to address a gap in the industrial hemp category where we don't have the education to teach engineers, to teach chefs, to teach designers how to work with that fabric. Uh, so if you talk to any engineer globally, they know how to build with specific types of materials. They can build with concrete, with wood, with sand substance. They don't learn how to build with hempcrete. If we talk to chefs, there are specific proteins that they study. They don't learn about hemp. And so what I'm doing at Consult DC is working with companies who are trying to bridge that gap. We bring industry expertise to those who are working in the hemp industry and show them how to apply it to the processing side. No. And on that note. <laughs> The story of cannabis is one of a silent provider, one that has fed us, clothed us, sheltered us, medicated us, and kept us alive for centuries. But what is cannabis? 
Cannabis sativa is a plant, the mom. She has two children. One of them is an artist, a creative, a visionary, one that sees opportunities and makes change happen. The other one is practical, pragmatic, resourceful, and strong. The creative one offers power through her flower, what we call marijuana. We use for medication and for recreation. The industrial one, hemp, flir flourishes in industrial use for its seeds, and from the stock we make fiber and hemp herd for building materials. Both have served humanity for generations. Emperor Shen Yong wrote the first medical text laying the foundation for Chinese medicine, and he listed cannabis as a treatment for malaria, for rheumatism, and as a sedative. Hemp fibers were used for bowstrings, and the cloths were used for swaddling infants, for covering bodies of the dead. The leaves were used to treat wounded soldiers. By 768, cannabis spread west, and King Charles the Great ordered hemp grown throughout his empire which proved pivotal because many families survived on hemp and, and water during the Dark Ages. Hemp is high in protein and can be made into a meal similar to porridge. During the Viking Age of Scandinavian exploration, hemp was used to arm their ships from the roaring seas. Hemp is two to three times stronger than sisal, than jute, which makes it perfect for cordage, rope, and it's unaffected by salt water, which makes it prime for sea sails, fishing nets, and other supplies that are routinely exposed to damp weather. In 1455, Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press. The Bible, the first great book printed in Western Europe from moving metal print, was typed on a blend of hemp paper. And when Christopher Columbus set out on his voyage across the Atlantic, 80 tons of hemp helped bring his ships to America. England's first botanist, William Turner, praises cannabis as a treatment in his book. And it was used throughout the 1800s for treatment of smallpox sores, palpitations. It was even prescribed to Queen Victoria to relieve her menstrual cramps. Throughout colonial America, Industrial hemp played a key role in cannabis in the survival and growth of the colonies. 1619, the Jamestown colony of Virginia passes a law requiring all farmers to grow hemp. This is the New World's first cannabis legislation. By the 1880s, 80% 80 of all textiles, fabrics, beddings, Textbooks in the U.S. were made out of hemp, which is ironic because today our textbooks have no mention of cannabis. The National Textile Museum has no reference to hemp. Mm. Cannabis was used for hundreds of illnesses and diseases throughout the U.S. From 1000 B.C. to the 19th century, cannabis was the largest domesticated crop on earth. But it wasn't easy. It was hard manual labor. It took families every effort they had to harvest and cultivate their farms, and they barely made ends meet. Think of processing cotton before the cotton gin. Now, the cotton gin was patented in 1793. And from 1800 onward, the amount of raw cotton yielded doubled every decade. The 1800s was also the heart of the Industrial Revolution. Industry was gaining power. Monopolization of fossil fuels, petroleums, timber industry, chemicals, all led hemp's production to decline. Yet on a federal level, cannabis was legal. The Federal Reserve was established in 1913 and in 1914. On the back of the $10 bill, there's a depiction of hemp farming. By the 1920s, industry was gaining power, 
and we see a shift in power to giant corporations and the need for mass production. Gasoline became huge business in, in America. The timber and log industry was growing in demand for building materials and for paper. William Hearst depended heavily on timber for his newspaper empire. We also see a wave of consolidations and mergers. The, chemi the chemical industry, DuPont, was a leader in fabrics and plastics. Reintroducing hemp, now that technology did exist, would have severely threatened the petrochemical industry, the timber industry, the chemical industry. What we yield from four acres of timber for paper, we can get from one acre of hemp. Timber takes an entire generation to regrow, whereas hemp, six months. Cotton uses 25% of pesticides worldwide. Cannabis grows with almost none. And so, William Hurst, Lamont DuPont, a man named Andrew Mellon, U.S. Secretary of Treasury, one of the richest men in the world, and a major investor in DuPont Chemicals. And his niece's husband? was Henry Anslinger, head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. His men had been out of work since alcohol prohibition ended in 1933. Mm. And so together, they set out with the collective goal to demonize and criminalize cannabis and those who use it. So how did they do it? Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, they planned and executed one of the most brilliant rebranding campaigns in history. See, they knew nobody would vote against cannabis. That's our medicine. No one's gonna vote against hemp. That's like voting against potatoes or cotton. But marijuana, that wasn't part of our rhetoric. That's not a word that we used. Marijuana has Mexican traditional origins from the name Maria Juana. That's one of them. It was popularized during the Re Mexican Revolutionary Era from 1910 to 1920. And so, they changed the name. They launched a smear campaign, starting with reefer madness, followed by a series of print propaganda, linking marijuana to insanity, linking marijuana to murder, and linking marijuana to death. And they won. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed. Licensing and taxation made it virtually impossible to cultivate cannabis without, severing, without enduring severe financial hardship. It was industrial espionage. It was malicious and deliberate. The following year, we have the first cannabis criminals in a wave of indictments. Yet on a federal level, cannabis is legal. In 1942, when the Japanese cut off manila hemp from the Philippines, the U.S. Department of Agriculture launched a hemp for victory, hemp for victory campaign, advocating and educating farmers on the history, the cultivation, and the uses of hemp. It remained legal and a case in 1969 between Professor Timothy Leary, a clinical psychologist in US Supreme Court. He was arrested under the Marijuana Tax Act and he appealed, claiming that the tax was unconstitutional because it required self-incrimination, which is against the Fifth Amendment. And he won. In 1970, the Marijuana Tax Act was repealed and the Controlled Substances Act was passed, making cannabis, the entire family, a Schedule I narcotic up there with heroin. And from that point on, the curve of incarcerations has been on the rise. And you know the story from here. Now, what are the possibilities moving forward? 
What, is, what are the changes that we must see in our social justice system to address those who have lost 10, 15, 20 years of their lives for possession of cannabis? What are the opportunities as we rebuild the infrastructure of an industry? What are the employment and job and training potentials for engineers, for scientists, for doctors, for lawyers, for designers, for chefs? Cannabis is a layer that we must integrate into all existing industries. It is not a new venture that we dive into. We've been living in a synthetic age and we're at the dawn of a natural transformation. Let's let cannabis lead the way. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> you said just hit next and then hopefully we'll be in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. I, I actually signed up to come after the history, not realizing how heavy it would be. Um, and you know, you didn't actually get into the history of sort of what I consider my present day, which is a, a, I'm a girl from East New York, Brooklyn. At one point, woo, woo, Brooklyn. At one point, the murder capital of the country. Um, and I'm a girl from the hood that made good, right? So um, again, I'm Dashita Dawson, and um, I'm actually a little bit of a reprieve from uh, some of the uh, slides, so we won't be going through uh, many slides. But I did want to talk to you a little bit about uh, my experience, which undoubtedly is a black experience. It isn't everybody's experience who's black in the industry, but it's certainly mine. Um, so again, I'm, I'm a girl from the hood that made good. What does that mean? It means that I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, and I did everything that uh, I was told to do, including uh, during that whole time period of the war on drugs, to say no to drugs and stay away completely. Um, I uh, had a successful prep school career, went on to attend Princeton University, where I majored in molecular biology. Um, I then went into the world of uh, business as an entrepreneur myself initially, but then I went back to school to get my MBA from Rutgers, are you? And so I'm Brooklyn born, Jersey educated, right? And all that time, to be perfectly honest, at no point did I ever think to myself that cannabis or marijuana as I knew it would have this much importance in my life. Um, throughout the time, I knew a lot of people who used, obviously. Um, it's something that happens within the hood all of the time. My mother was a daily user, despite being an educator, and um, she still leveraged it. It was one of those things where we just don't talk about it, right? But, <laughs> but we knew it was going on. So in many ways, like a lot of people, I grew up in an environment where there was a, almost an internal conflict, right, around the plant itself. On the one hand, I needed to stay away from it in order to be successful, to stay out of jail, to stay out of trouble, primarily. Um, but at the same time, I, the people that I loved, the people that took care of me, used it fairly freely. And they were still good people, changing the community, changing um, the world, to be perfectly honest. So fast forward into 2012 where I moved to Target and I moved from Brooklyn to uh, negative 15 degree weather in Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota, actually. Um, <laughs> and I lived there for four years, but one of the things I realized after being a D1 athlete, I played basketball, I'm a point guard, um, I had severe polyarthritis, so arthritis in multiple joints, and I never really dealt with, I really dealt with pain, but I was used to it. But when I got there, negative 15 degrees on a joint that's inflamed, even a small inflammation, it becomes hugely inflamed. And at the same time, my mother was unfortunately suffering from breast cancer and she was getting her treatment at Mayo Clinic. And she was, like I said, a lifelong user. Uh, it really took maybe, she, you know, she convinced me one time after I finally got my offer and I was in the job. She's like, listen, just, you know, you only live one time, have a smoke with your mom. It took that one time <laughs> to have a smoke with her because um, she was allowed in my mind. She was going through chemo, right? So in that way, although not legal yet in Minnesota, socially acceptable, right? And so I was jumping through hoops to make sure she had that. But it took that one smoke with her 
And the next day I woke up where I normally wake up like the tin woman and I can't move. I woke up so much more refreshed. My body felt better. And immediately the scientist in me, I was no longer a businesswoman. I was now a scientist started to click and say, hey, something about what just happened changed my entire body overnight. Like not not even in a, a small amount, and I didn't and I didn't smoke a lot. I'm a one hit wonder, so I did not smoke a lot. Um, but I realized that experience right after, and I went to work. What did that mean? I went to work almost testing in a very micro dose, small dosing kind of way on myself. I wanted to know what worked for me and why it maybe was different from what worked for my mother. I did that while I was an executive at Target, while I was driving uh, half a billion dollars in increase mental sales. I consumed every day privately in a closet while I was doing so, while I moved from Target to a director position at Victoria's Secret in New York, and then another uh, director position. I had no issues doing my daily um, greatness. I was black girl magic walking, and uh, privately I was consuming and making sure that I felt good. Um, so then you ask, how do you come become a cannabis executive and an advocate? Well, eventually, uh, unfortunately, while my mother fought the good fight and she did beat her breast cancer, four years later in 2016, something catastrophic happened for me and my sisters. My mom unexpectedly passed away. And it's one of those things where you feel a complete shift. I'll be honest, I'm not the same girl that I was before that day. Um, and it immediately shook my world so much that I knew I needed to look at things differently. And that became looking at the corporate plantation, if you will, as a burden. I was given my best brain work. I had driven nearly a billion dollars of incremental sales for all of my strategic work. And how much of it did I have in my actual bank? Not much. And so the proposition or the return on investment just wasn't there. And I'll be honest, I wasn't looking at cannabis as a business. I was actually a patient. I left work. I was depressed. My mother just passed. And I moved to a state where it was legal. In some ways, I was a refugee, right, that needed to leave the state that it wasn't legal to some place where I could get the support I needed. And so I moved to Arizona where my aunt was already a patient. for, And she'd been there for 25 years. So she showed me. And she was sort of the lay of the land. I would say immediately, as soon as I had my first experience, and I, I, I hate to say it, it just was incongruent with what I knew the plant could do. The butt tender knew less than I did, and she had four or five years of experience. I apparently had four years of you know, experience you know, experimenting on myself, but I knew more from a scientific perspective. Very little of the information that I was getting was coming from a real science perspective. And I knew that I needed to take my skill set that I learned in corporate America and bring it into this space. And so what was I gifted at? I was gifted at strategy, especially in the case where we have new markets, new business, white space opportunity, and especially in the cases where we needed to rebrand something. I worked in the African American hair market, I mean, which has transformed significantly. I was, I've never had a perm, so I was the only person in school with this afro. And now I walk around and this is what we see primarily. And so to be a part of that revolution, I was part of the revolution of the plus size industry. I started to see that there were clear benchmarks that we could utilize if you were bringing it with a strategic mindset, we could utilize that here in the, the cannabis industry. And so I jumped in and I formed MJM Strategy. And very quickly, it almost was like a snowball effect, I started to meet with other people who were also what I consider credentialed, right? The cannabis industry, when you start off, and it is one of those things where it's still new, there aren't a lot of corporate to cannabis crossovers like myself. And so I wanted to make sure people knew that there was an opportunity. And so I branded myself the weed head. I figured if I'm gonna start with rebranding anything, let me start with myself. Um, I'm the most productive in individual, any of my friends know, I'm probably one of the most successful ones that they know as well, so great. I'm gonna call myself the weed head. <laughs> and I'm gonna have everybody challenge me on exactly what does that mean. And so um, it, that brings me sort of fast forward here today. Almost three years later, my business is thriving. It is a family business. I um, am lucky to be able to work with my three sisters who also join um, full time in the business and um, as well as a host of other beautiful black people in, uh, who are corporate to cannabis crossovers. We're trying to redefine and rebrand the industry 
And it does start with working with clients, municipalities, nonprofit organizations like DPA that really do need to go back into the communities to educate. But I think it also is about showcasing ourselves as the new faces of cannabis. No, no disrespect to Cheech and Chong or Snoop or uh, and how high, all of these references will always be iconic, but we are by and large uh, more and more uh, patients in the industry. I am a patient and I want it to be one with dignity. Um, and so that means being able to tell people my story and know that I can share with them true scientific information and education. But I also could share with them a community. And um, without further ado, I, you know, I didn't want to go too, too long. I'm going to share a video where um, I consider it us dubbing us the new faces of cannabis. Um, this is so some of the campaign work that I do with clients as we start to, again, rebrand cannabis and re-educate people on not only what we look like as users, but what can be expected from a user, right? Everybody assumes a weed head is somebody that's stuck in the couch and maybe not doing anything. No one would ever guess that it's a, you know, a black uh, woman who is highly credentialed, working every single day in the industry and striving to be the best that she can be, always. Um, and so we're kind of turning it on the head and making sure that we share our stories so that there are more people like yourself willing to cross over in the industry because that's the only way we're going to see it thrive. So I'm going to try really quickly to play our video. Um, let's hope that it actually does. No press play here. Ah, technology. Yes. I brand everything, sorry. <laughs> Oh, there it is. Make the first one. Thank you. It's playing here. In the meantime, I did want to also just quickly introduce a giveaway. We are a 100% remote company. I took a lot of uh, business units from in, in office to remote, so there's a lot of cost savings related to it. We uh, focus in the digital world, so we actually have an Instagram challenge going on right now where we are giving away one of my t-shirts that we had, as well as a book that I love. It's called The ABCs of CBD. Essentially, it's almost like your girlfriend's guide to learning about um, cannabinoids, which is the molecule inside the cannabis plant, and specifically CBD, which is one of the molecules that everyone focuses on because it is one that does not necessarily impact, um, well, it is psychoactive still, but it's not psychoactive in the same way THC is. I don't like to simplify science in that way. I apologize. But um, the very simple thing that I always ask people to do, because we, we, you included, are the new faces of cannabis. The first thing is if you're following uh, on Instagram, following myself, the cannabis CEO on Instagram, and to take a picture of yourself here as well at, um, and or visit our booth, 624 and tag the hashtag for the conference as well as hashtag diversity in cannabis. Because one of the things that we don't see in social media, you can see mad weed pics, which maybe is the girl naked and shit. If you believe that we are all change agents, I want you to stand to your feet. And so that's almost up, but it's not playing here. Hopefully we can get it working. Yeah, hopefully. But your slide was working. So I don't know why that's not happening.
Okay, so while we are, we're going to play uh, the Sheeta's commercial actually at the end of. See, now that's your play. Yeah? That's your play. <laughs> okay, sounds good. We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay. Can I put full screen? Okay. Okay, we're just going to. Uh, technology. Yeah, we're going to let this load and we're going to bring up Ms. Cassandra. I will circle back at the end yeah. and tell everybody about the giveaway. It's really after the video that we're supposed oh, to do the giveaway anyway. But. Oh, that's how it's advancing. Mm -hmm. So right now, I feel like I'm in the second grade. Like, who knows how to work events technology? So uh, while we go ahead and work this, I know Cassandra has been doing this work for some time. So let's go ahead with the presentations while we work on the, um, the audio visual stuff. It's okay. It's okay. So um, <laughs> again, my name is uh, Cassandra Frederick, and I'm with the Drug Policy Alliance. And I think the name of this event is uh, The Black Experience in Cannabis. And I think you can't talk about the black experience in cannabis without talking about the black experience of criminalization in cannabis. Uh, there is, you know, to uh, the point of the previous speakers, a lot of history as to how we got here, and also just the relearning um, and rebranding of the topic, um, but one that is clear and is consistent is the role that drugs have played in the criminalization of black folks. And so essentially what I would like to talk about is, this, is the work that I've done using New York as a case study of the criminalization of cannabis in our country. So fast forward in the 30s as Harry Anslinger moves forward with his conversation. Something happened in New York. Our governor, our mayor of New York City, LaGuardia, um, did his own commission. And he looked at the science of cannabis and saw, and basically did his own study. And what he found was that the, the science and the conversation that was put forward in Washington, D.C. was largely exaggerated. He said, this is actually not a good use of resources. This goes against everything. Everything is overblown. Um, and they're wrong. The Mayor LaGuardia wanted to move on to be president, just like every other politician in New York. And because of political calculuses, he disappeared. And so did his commission report. But in the 70s, in the early 70s, 
um, there was a liberalization of the conversation of cannabis. States around the country moved to decriminalize cannabis. So in places like New York in 1977, we actually removed criminal penalties for up to 25 grams um, for simple possession for people. That happened in 1977. Actually, if you look at the usage rates of cannabis in New York, it was actually at its highest during that time. And in that moment, the New York State Legislature decided that they thought that the resources being put in to criminalizing cannabis were too great. And this is important because what happened in 1971 is that Richard Nixon declared this version of the war on drugs. And in New York, our governor, Nelson Rockefeller, figured out how to do that um, and how to operationalize that. And so he created the Rockefeller drug laws, which were the first set of mandatory minimums for drug possession in the country, which was then later exported. And marijuana was a part of the Rockefeller drug laws. So people were facing 12 years to life for simple possession. Now, I wasn't born in the 70s. I wasn't even an afterthought in the 70s. But based on the things that I've watched about the 70s, people smoked a lot of weed in the 70s. Yes, we did. They, <laughs> I wasn't asking for hands, but. <laughs> sure, sure. You go, you go. You are no shade, no stigma, no shade. Um, you can go. So in the 1970s, people were getting arrested for marijuana and they were facing 12 years to life. So some of the most powerful people in the world are white people. And we are in a situation in the 70s where white mothers went to district attorneys in New York and said, I get it that Mark and Wendy should not be smoking weed, but they can't face 12 years to life. We won't allow it. So then the district attorneys then went to Albany legislatures, Albany is our capital in New York, went to Albany and said, we have to do something because these white moms are not playing with us. In Albany, 1977, a legislator from Buffalo, a legislator from Manhattan and Brooklyn passed the Marijuana Decriminalization Act of 1977, mm -hmm. which basically, again, as I said, removed criminal penalties for simple possession of marijuana for up to 25 grams. However, if marijuana was burning, or if, it was, if you were waving it in the air like you just didn't care, that was an arrestable misdemeanor. That had been the law in New York since 1977. And for the most part, it was fine. There weren't that many people getting arrested for marijuana. Again, when I watch movies about New York City in the, in the 70s and 80s, it was pretty lit. There was a lot of stuff going on there. So people really weren't focusing on it. Now, when you move into the mid-1990s, Mayor Giuliani comes into play. You know this guy, Giuliani? Y'all seen him on the news? Yes. Unfortunately, he comes in and he brings in a police commissioner, Bratton. And what they focus on is this conversation around broken windows policing, focusing on quality of life arrests, and what they did was they used marijuana as a way to get people, literally going into communities and picking up all the black and Latino people they could find. And they did this in the idea of quality of life and public safety. What happens, what happens when we have already decided that we are decriminalizing cannabis, but yet move with a policing strategy that prioritizes cannabis? You get 800,000 people being arrested for cannabis possession solely in New York. 800,000 people, despite the fact that we removed criminal penalties for cannabis in 1977. And who is getting arrested for cannabis in New York City? Black and Latino people, mostly black people. In every neighborhood. Even the neighborhoods that black people don't live in, the racial disparities of black people getting arrested are highest. When I saw, first came to Drug Policy Alliance, my first campaign was working on marijuana reform. In 2010, so, so, so. New York City alone had 50,000 
384,000 arrests, more than everybody else. In 2011, New York City had 50,687,000 people who got arrested for marijuana. And that's marijuana as the top charge. Not marijuana and a gun, not marijuana and assault, just, just simple possession. 86% mm -hmm. of those arrests were black and Latino. 70% of those arrests were under the age of 29. 52% of that, those arrests were between the ages of 16 and 21. It is 2018. New York City is right now under 10,000 arrests. And that was based on advocacy and really understanding what was going forward. NYPD had to account for the reason why they were moving towards criminalization. But what happened in New York City is what happens all around the country. It happens in DC, it happens in LA, it happens in Atlanta. The conversation of the way that the criminalization of marijuana has been used to become the number four reason why people are deported from this country. And people oftentimes when they're thinking about deportation, they're not thinking about black people, right? But that's wrong because black people are actually more likely to in, interact with law enforcement, which makes their immigration consequences that much more dire. And I say that as someone who is a black immigrant, my parents are Haitian. So the fact is that people are getting deported, or even if you have a green card, if you go visit back home, you can't get back into the country based on a simple marijuana possession arrest. As someone who's a social worker, if we think about the way that gender plays into the criminalization of marijuana, we have to think about the women that are getting tested to get access to social services. We have to think about the women that are getting kicked out of public housing because their son got arrested on public housing property, and if they don't kick them out of the housing, then they get kicked out of public housing all in general. No one's talking about the fact that HUD just passed a provision that people can't smoke tobacco in public housing anymore. And if they can't smoke tobacco in public housing, they definitely can't smoke weed in public housing either. So thinking about all the different ways that we have used cannabis as a way to criminalize communities is, is the responsibility of the black cannabis industry. Um, because we're not going to be a legitimate industry if we're not also simultaneously dealing with the criminalization associated with the way that we look. Um, and so it's important that, you know, we've gotten to this place in New York where we are, you know, one of the last places to, well, not one of the last places, but we're pretty far behind in moving forward the conversation of innovative marijuana reform. But we're in a place where NYPD, the most notorious police force in the country that I would argue, no longer is arresting people for simple possession and as of September 1st is no longer arresting people for smoking in public. And that comes from dedicated advocacy from people throughout the country, right? And that doesn't happen without having conversation because while I definitely agree with you about the rebranding, we can't rebrand and throw away our people at the same time. Because, if it, because this conversation around marijuana reform would not be where it was until 2009 and 2010 when, when black drug policy reformers forced marijuana and cannabis advocates to talk about race. They did not want to talk about race. They only wanted to talk about science. And it was race that has pushed this policy agenda forward. And for that alone, means that as we continue to move forward, we cannot divorce this conversation about the criminalization, and we cannot whitewash how we got to this moment. We can't pick one over the other. We have to do both at the same time, because the people that have been arrested, the people that have been killed, the, the black women that have consistently been raped by law enforcement so that they don't get a marijuana charge, Please read the book, Invisible No More, by a black woman, Andrea Ritchie, who talks about the way that drugs have been used to create the sexual assault of black women and women of color. Those women, Eric Garner, Ramarley Graham, are the reason why we can sit in this room, because people started to have to pay attention to it, because it is very much a civil rights issue. It is a civil rights issue just as much as it's an economic justice issue, as much as it is a public health issue. 
And therefore, as we move forward, we have to recognize that the stigmatization associated with people who do use cannabis and have a problem, I see y'all, are just as important as those that are credentialized. Thank you again for having me here today. It really is an honor to be a part of uh, this, this discussion, this panel, and it, everything to do with the cannabis uh, industry and space, especially as uh, uh, being minorities, and trying to move forward potentially in a positive way. Um, I'm going to start this off with, with one thought for you that comes from our Iroquois uh, traditions and something that we believe in, we live in, and try and work through every day. And that saying is, the decisions that you make today affect those seven generations after you. And why do we say that? Because it's not just about us and where, what we are and what we're doing today, but what does it mean to help those generations that are coming after us? What are the decisions and the positives and the things that we can take away from the social injustices and the things that we've learned from the past and move our communities forward with this economic opportunity? How can we move this potentially forward with this economic opportunity? Where we come from, in my experiences, coming from a reservation, um, growing up really basically with not a whole lot, um, being able to come to be able to speak to you in front of this stage um, today, just, just having that self-determination to keep a positive uh, motive, continue to move, move the agenda forward, comes from our traditional beliefs. And, and keeping those things uh, in, in the front of you. Let me give you one statistic that uh, rings out that it's 32.4 billion. And why do I say that? The opportunities in this industry that, that are, are out there are immense. And why do I say 32.4 billion? We as Native communities have, um, do gaming. We have huge gaming revenues in this, in this country. We own 40% of the gaming market. When I go talk to Native communities, when I go talk to other minority communities, I try to use that as a parallel to what the potential is for people to be able to get in this industry. As I stated earlier, I've been in this industry for about five and a half years doing different licenses, working in different countries, going after different opportunities. The, what, we're work, what even we work, we're working right on now, I'm working in the country of Canada. I'm working with different First Nations first, and different reservations and tribal communities in Canada. Now that it has become federally legal across the country. To be able to look at an example of a G7 country that is looking to set the standards, that's looking to set um, regulations that can move um, all communities forward within this industry. Um, our, our company in Canada is called Turtle Island Corporation. It's, it's a fully native-owned com uh, company where we have cultivation centers, we have dispensary wellness centers on territory. We do everything in our native communities. We employ, we employ um, our, our uh, tribal members. We, we give them access. We take some of those funds, we give them back. We put them into social uh, programs, whether it's medical, education, um, housing, policing. We really try and make this a community effort because we as Native communities, that's what we are. And minority communities, I think, have a lot of those similarities. We all are very communal. We all are there to build each other up, there to help each other, and really try and make a positive difference in our communities. Another thing that we've been working on um, over this past year to help move this agenda forward within, within our communities, which can be obviously used in, in, in any minority community, is called the First Nations Coin. We're creating our own cryptocurrency to be able to be able to use to help with our self-sustainability and our sovereignty. We, don't believe, we believe that any community can be sovereign. You can be self-reliant on yourself, being able to take and create an industry that folks said, oh, you know, can you be involved? Can you do this? Like, that's why I referenced the gaming, the gaming community at 32.4 billion. It's taken 40 years to get there, but 
we believe in the cannabis space, we can get there a lot quicker, especially as minority communities. When I go talk to tribal councils and tribal leaders and tribal communities, one of the things, whether, especially we talk about with hemp, um, not just cannabis in itself, but hemp. And you look around the United States and, and where we all come from as, as diverse people, my message to them is it's economic development and it's agriculture at the end of the day. And if you really want to go back in history and educate people, especially the leadership, folks that, whether it's your congressional state <laughs> leaders, your local community leaders, it goes back to treaties even. There's treaties that, that state in there that you cannot be taxed for farming and fishing. But what are you doing on your land? What are you doing for the resources you have? We as Native communities, we have a lot of land and people a lot of jobs. What do a lot of my, other minority communities have? You have a lot of buildings, you have a lot of land, you have a lot of this, people a lot of work. What are you trying to move, do to move the agenda forward? Um, there's, there's, you know, it, it comes difficult sometimes to get access to capital. I hear a lot of that when it comes to the minority communities, people being able to access capital, being able to do, to be able to get into this uh, space because it, it's not cheap. You know, hopefully you don't have to mortgage your house. Hopefully you don't have to do this to be able to be successful in this business. But we can work together to be able to move this agenda forward as minority communities in a positive way. Um, so those are just some of these examples that uh, I've, I've been fortunate enough to actually be involved with. One of my partners and colleagues here in the back that does work here with me is Brian Abrams. He's been instrumental in helping me here in DC and keeps, keeps me grounded. Uh, I thank him for a lot of work. He works on a lot of the projects with me. And um, these are, I just wanted to be able to share some of the thoughts and ideas out there, kind of get you thinking outside of the box. What are the possibilities? What can you really do? Where can you really go forward in the space? How can you take this and utilize it for yourself to become self-sufficient, keep your sovereignty, keep who you are as a minority community, but use it in a positive and continue to help those that come after us? Like I said, I'll, I'll end it with that just in case. The decision that you make today affect those seven generations after. And just to be able to have that thought with you and hopefully you can take that with you and just keep that positive and keep pushing forward with everything like the folks up here on the panel, everybody here that has put this together. So I thank you for the opportunity to be able to uh, speak with you today. So thank you. Again. That was profound. And I am extremely um, thankful for you being patient with our technology um, <laughs> setbacks. But we're going to keep moving forward. We have another set of dynamic speakers, and we are going to be covering the social uh, justices and injustices, as well as the equity and opportunity in the cannabis industry. So let's give these people a round of applause. And they will be here. Um, they'll be in the audience. And after the presentations, um, I encourage you, I almost demand you to um, speak to them, ask questions, get more information, and find out what you can do in your respective states to begin to make change around policy and advocacy and to impact and educate others who are not yet I'm savvy about this industry. And I'm going to pass back to the wonderful Dr. Shonda Macias and introduce our next set of speakers. So our next set of speakers, first will be um, to the panel will be John Olson from James Henry out of San Francisco. <laughs> Michael Harlow, CPA. Dr. Henry Lowe and Hope Wiseman.
Oh, good stuff. Um, yes, I will. <laughs> How's everyone doing today? Awesome, awesome. My name is James Victor, and I am co-founder of James Henry SF. It's a responsible cannabis lifestyle brand based out of California. Uh, prior to getting into cannabis, it's pretty interesting because I would have never thought I would be in this space uh, like the Sheeta. I am also from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I'm from psychotic Haitian parents who absolutely made it clear that you do not do any form of cannabis. You stay strict. You do not do... I didn't even drink until after I was 22. So just to stay on the strict level of education, I made sure to get the right grades, went to the top business school in the nation at the time, and I spent 20 years of real estate development in New York City, and majority of what you see Harlem today. And from that point forward, uh, I was introduced to the cannabis space, uh, not as a patient, but almost as a business opportunity that I declined because of the federal uh, and, and, and the ramifications that came along with this drug. Upon doing research and meeting some amazing doctors who you meet today, as well as scientists, and what I've learned became so shocking and hit me in a place in my soul so bad that I became committed to this uh, advocacy, as well as bringing this light to people of all, all shapes and form, especially within our own communities who have a negative connotation when it comes to the word cannabis, marijuana, or anything of the such. Uh, I'm going to pass this along to my business partner, John Alston, uh, who will also introduce himself. Good afternoon, everyone. I can't tell you guys how honored I am to stand before you um, at this annual legislative conference to talk about um, the social equity and opportunities in the cannabis space. Um, a lot of great speakers to uh, follow up behind, but a lot of great messages in that. Um, I empathize a lot with uh, Dashita in terms of rebranding uh, how the general public views cannabis, but also I empathize with Cassandra in terms of making sure that our communities are not left behind. And that was some things that James and I built into our business model from the start. Um, so. To introduce that, a little bit about my background is that um, I graduated from Southern University, an HBCU graduate uh, with a mechanical engineering degree. And I was a ROTC scholarship student, so I commissioned into the United States Navy and I flew for about three years before I took the early reduction in force when President Obama was in office. With that, I uh, took that as an opportunity to get a head start on that engineering degree and I worked for an atmospheric gas company uh, as a national manufacturing process uh, lead. And I learned something about uh, CO2 extraction in the spice industry that I was able to relate in the cannabis industry a few years later. I've worked with uh, the Whirlpool Corporation on several manufacturing lines. Um, I'm a practicing Lean Six Sigma Black Belt, and I still say practicing because these are translatable skills that I did bring with me to the cannabis industry that was very necessary. So, um, with that being said, I discovered cannabis initially as a patient. I didn't know I was a patient yet. <laughs> uh, I, suffered with a, <laughs> I suffered with a little bit of insomnia. And uh, when I moved from New York City to uh, my, my job for Whirlpool Corporation in Oklahoma, uh, I, actually, I actually had a cancer scare with my mom, uh, and it was breast cancer. The thing about being a Louisiana native is that cancer and a lot of illnesses can actually be helped, if not healed, and cured in totality with cannabis, in my opinion. And it was something that we were blessed and fortunate with because my mother only needed a few rounds of radiation, and it wasn't anything else that we were too concerned about from a medical standpoint, other than when I did my research in cannabis and realized that she didn't have to take the prescription pharmaceutical to prevent the cancer, I switched over to a tincture, a full spectrum tincture that was non-euphoric, to a lady that absolutely bawled when I told her that I was leaving this nice paying engineering job and going to do this entrepreneurial journey in cannabis. 
it. She thought I'd absolutely lost my mind, and she cried actually several times. But today, when I talk with her and everything, the conversations are more about the business and how well we're performing and what we're doing. With James Henry, we wanted to incorporate the science, the health and wellness factors, while giving back to the community at the same time, and we decided to participate in the nation's first equity program in Oakland, California. And with that, it's such a great win for the community and for minorities in the space. It creates a lot of opportunities and it creates a lot of challenges. But my message, and then I'll take my seat and let uh, the rest of the panelists come up and everything. Uh, my, message with, my message with that is that um, it is a problem and an issue in social equity and cannabis that needs to be resolved together and we have to do it together if we want to sustain black and brown businesses in the future of the rising cannabis industry. The rising cannabis industry is scientifically and medicinally focused. We don't know what the federal regulations are gonna hold in store for us, even in recreational states. But in the meantime, as business owners and potential entrepreneurs in cannabis, if you are looking to invest, if you are looking to get involved in this space, there's a lot of opportunity to work together with the equity applicants and with the people that have been negatively impacted by these war on drugs. People that have been impacted by the war on drugs aren't necessarily the model representation that an investor with the multi-millions of dollars wants to trust to give them a profitable return. <laughs> and these are real conversations that we're having with these investors. So what that means is that it's an opportunity for young entrepreneurs that have business degrees, that have engineering degrees, that have law degrees, that have financial backgrounds, to absolutely work together with these equity applicants that have advantages because of what was considered disadvantageous circumstances. What the city of Oakland has done, the city of Oakland has implemented an equity program that has given black and brown faces and people that have been negatively impacted by the war on drugs the opportunity for priority licensing in California, in Oakland. And the great thing about that is that they don't have to be responsible for certain application fees. They don't have to be responsible for certain state licensing fees. Well, for young minority entrepreneurs that are still looking to make that first million, that's a lot. That's something that we can all work with. And so all it takes is a community of people that actually want to put forth the effort to take advantage of things that are already available and help fight for things in other areas that aren't available yet. Because the experience that we're getting in California with James Henry focused on specifically battling the negative stigma around cannabis consumption in our communities, yeah, that is absolutely a model that needs to be taken to my home state in Louisiana. To, it needs to be approved and passed in other states across the nation. Help us get there, find other entrepreneurial opportunities in the cannabis space. The future of cannabis is not in the recreational branding. Nobody wants to see Slimer on a jar. Nobody wants to see that negative cartoony stigma behind it. If you're an artist, if you're a marketing professional, there's a lot of opportunities for you to come specifically and help these equity businesses out that need that connection from a professional standpoint for it to make sense. And so with that being said, if you have any questions or anything, James and I are available after. But in the meantime, I'll pass it over to uh, Hope and uh, to the other panelists as well. Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me to come out to the people who organize this event. My name is Hope Wiseman. I'm one of the owners of Marion, Maine, a medical cannabis dispensary that just recently opened last week in Capitol Heights, Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so excited to share with you um, my journey because 
like John just explained, it was a very, very tough journey for my company, which is 100% African American owned. Um, we thank you. We bootstrapped the entire process, um, and I mean, it's been a journey. And now I'm realizing that the real work has just begun. But um, okay, so I'll start from the beginning. Um, four years ago, I had graduated from Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. I was an economics major, and all my previous work experience had been in investment banking. Um, I was working for SunTrust Robinson Humphrey doing equity institutional sales, and I just was following the industry. I had been a, uh, I was also a patient and didn't know I was a patient. I didn't know I, what I was treating at the time, but now I realize it was anxiety and depression, much like a lot of people who are first introduced to cannabis. Um, I had just graduated, I was working. I liked my job, but I didn't love it. I was always searching for something where I could fulfill or feel as though I was fulfill, fulfilling my purpose. Um, I realized that the cannabis industry was the next up and coming industry. And from my background in economics, that first caught my interest. So I realized that Maryland, my home state, uh, had just developed regulations and they were about to have an application process. I went to my mother, who's a dentist, and um, she in Prince George's County, where we now have a license. Uh, and she is a very successful entrepreneur, started her dental practice the year I was born. I was six months in her office every day. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely get that from her. But as a health practitioner, she thought it was an amazing idea to put together a team of African Americans to apply for a license in an area that is predominantly African American. So we put together a team. Thank you. Thank you. We put together a team. We went and um, we got a third partner, Dr. Larry Bryant, who is an oral surgeon in uh, Prince George's County as well. And the three of us um, and two other people that helped us, we sat in my mother's uh, office in her break room and put together our application. We were in there working almost 16 hours for 30 days when the application came out. And we had been putting together um, a team for months before that, gathering information. It was a very, very strenuous process. We had no idea what we were doing four years ago. Um, I, we had no real introduction to the industry. We had sought out a consultant who introduced me to a lot of people that are here in this room right now. Um, and I, that's how I was able to gain the knowledge that I think ultimately won us a dispensary license. We applied for all three, a grow, processing, and dispensary license, but were only awarded um, the retail license. Um, if you were following the process in Maryland, you'll, you might know that no minority-owned companies were given a grow license and one was given a processing license and they're represented here in this room as well, Prime Extracts, they're back there. Just give it up for them. So uh, when we were awarded the license in 2016, so that was all 2014, we applied in 2015, and then 2016 runs, uh, comes around, we are finally awarded the license. Um, we were awarded in District 25, Capitol Heights. Um, and PG, PG County and Anne Arundel County gave out very strenuous uh, zoning regulations that we had to abide by. So a lot of people in Prince George's County were unable, still to this day, unable to get a location um, because zoning was so difficult to navigate. We were able to get around that situation. My mother and I both have backgrounds in real estate as well. So we figured that out. We got a location. We had to purchase a building. Um, it was a very, very costly endeavor, but we decided that long term it was the best choice. Um, owns excess real estate. You've got half of the problem figured out. But then you have to step back and, and think about, well, who is it that has all this excess real estate? Well, it's longtime wealthy real estate developers. They tend to be white. They tend to be over 65, you know, and it's an inherent issue. And then we talk a lot about the differences between East and West Coast markets. And we talk about that because a lot of clients at, call us asking about, well, where should I invest my money? You know, should I go for an application in California? Should I look in one of the East Coast markets? And what clients have to understand is that the cannabis market across the country is extremely different. You have 
um, different state regulations in every state. You have completely different programs everywhere. You have very, um, I wouldn't say lax, but it's much easier to acquire an application or a license in California, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington than it is in the East Coast states, what we think of as the heavily regulated, limited license states as opposed to the much more um, open states on the West Coast. Um, so we tend to believe there's much more value on the East Coast states. I mean, it's a monopoly. The states have limited the license applications. You know what your patient count is gonna be, or at least you should be able to pro project it relatively easily. Whereas in Oregon, you've seen you know, everybody and their brother apply for a license, and you've seen the price of flour drop 50% over the past 18 months. So most people are pushing towards going into the East Coast markets. The problem is the same regulation that's created the limited licenses that theoretically was set up to make business successful has also made the barrier to entry that much higher. And so we see, or saw, in Maryland, uh, people that were successful getting cultivation licenses, which most people would argue is the most valuable license, spending anywhere between half a million and three quarters of a million dollars on their license applications. And this is in an industry that has no access to finance. So 100% of, uh, of the proceeds for these businesses is all equity. Well, where do people get that kind of cash? I mean, these are all long-time existing business holders. These aren't startup business owners that are putting $5 million in a cultivation facility for a 10% interest. I mean, these are people that already have wealth. So the limitations on licenses has actually created a perverse situation where people that got into or were successful were the very people that were already had access to money. Um, so one of, the, one of the many ways that I believe you could um, bring more equality, equity into the marketplace is by access to finance. Because right now, if you can't get a loan, that means you're going to a family office or other high net worth individuals to get money. And we see, um, and I can, and we, we did brainstorm about this within the office about what exactly we should talk about. And I said, I can honestly talk about the fact that we do go to client meetings and we meet, meet the investors and the investors, excuse me, look a lot like me, just older. And the employees look a lot like, more like you. I mean, the employees, the people with the experience in the industry in either the black or the gray market, the growers, the cultivators, so you have a, a whole different group of people coming in on the finance side as opposed to people working in the industry. And that's not really a secret. Um, I don't really think that's a controversial thing to say. Crazy. Yep. It's a reality. So, yeah. <laughs> no, right. it's a reality. so then um, the question is what do you do about it? I think access to finance would go a long way. I think barriers to entry, I mean, these same East Coast states, New Jersey, New York, Maryland, um, you know, Virginia has a new program coming online. You can argue about whether or not it's going to be a very robust program or it's going to be successful. Five licenses in the whole state of Virginia. All right, five licenses in the whole state of Virginia that are all required to be completely vertically integrated. So cultivation, processing, and dispensaries all within the same license. So. How much opportunity is there for minority investment in the industry when you have all the five licenses? Um, and of course, you're gonna have a major leg up on getting one of those five licenses if you can secure the real estate ahead of time. And you have to secure the real estate by paying 100% cash for it because nobody's gonna finance the real estate. Um, these are the issues we deal with on a regular basis. And you know, from our standpoint, it's great. I mean, the more regulation there is in the industry, the more clients are going to pay us to try to figure out how to do it and how to tr structure the transaction and take the real estate investor and introduce them to the operator and figure out a way to build a waterfall and a partnership agreement so that everybody gets paid. You know, for us, regulation is like wonderful. That's how we make money. For the business owner, not so much. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of policymakers have with good intentions try to create very restricted licensed markets because they don't want to see something like Oregon where prices drop 50% and you're going to see a ton of people go out of business. I don't know, maybe that's not such, thin, such a bad thing. I mean, having a lower barrier to entry and having more people in the market and then having people that um, you know, can't be successful close down shop, 
That's capitalism. So, you know, in our, in our zeal to try to create these limited market uh, states on the East Coast, I think policymakers have created um, maybe some unanticipated consequences. Um, so, having said that, I'll take a seat. If anyone likes, wants to talk about tax stuff, I'll be right. <laughs> Sure. Okay. Um, so 280E is the IRS code section, uh, and I'll try to keep this brief because this is what I normally talk about. 280E is the IRS code section that specifically says that for illegal drug trafficking, Schedule One narcotics, you are allowed no deductions on your federal income tax return other than cost of goods sold. Okay. E even if you are in an illegal business, you still have to theoretically file a tax return and report 100% of your worldwide income. Okay? If it's a Schedule One narcotic, you can't deduct anything except for cost of goods sold. Okay? Now this also has an interesting unintended consequence because in a cultivation business, most of what you're doing is going to be related to cost of goods sold. Okay? So in a cultivation business, we don't see 280E as necessarily the end of the world because 80, 90% of your costs are still going to be deductible. Everything you're doing theoretically is related to producing the product. It's harder to get a cultivation license in most states than it is to get a retail license for some of the reasons I've already mentioned. Okay? So in a dispensary environment, you have a much larger 280E problem. So your effective tax rate in the dispensary is probably going to run you 70 to 80 percent federal, right? Because if you think about it, the only thing you can deduct on that tax return is your cost of goods sold, what you theoretically paid for the product that you bought from the cultivator who doesn't really have a 280E problem. So the dispensary model is very challenging. The only one that's really worse is in California where they have a distribution model, which is a new license specific to California. In California, the, if you think about it, the distribution license is a definition of trafficking. All you're doing is picking up the product from one place and moving it to another. You never take ownership of the product, well, depending on the way the contract works. You get it tested, but it's never actually your product. So the um, labor you're paying for your drivers, the trucks, the delivery vans, the insurance, all that stuff, non-deductible. So we see these distribution license holders paying uh, 80, 90 percent effective tax rates. And we've seen clients in California receive or be successful getting distribution licenses and then just sit on them. And they're waiting for some 280E change because the distribution license will be much more valuable and lucrative after a 280E change. So there's two current bills. Um, in the Senate, the uh, strengthening the Tenth Amendment, something act, the State Act. Uh, that's the uh, Cory Gardner bill. Um, and then there's the Chuck Schumer MOFA Act, both introduced about two weeks apart. The State Act is pretty straightforward. It basically says that Schedule One narcotics and um, DA legislation doesn't apply to state regulated markets. Um, so that's a step in the right direction. Theoretically, that would fix your 280E problem. I don't know that it fixes your banking problem. Um, and then the Schumer bill, which was introduced a little bit later, is very similar. It, in, it includes some more provisions for um, expungement of records and some other positive things. But my real concern is that even though both these bills were announced back in the middle of the summer with much fanfare, there's been zero activity since then. So, you know, I was talking to clients three or four months ago who were looking to buy licenses or invest in licenses in other states because they thought the whole world was about to change. And now we've kind of settled into, I don't know, maybe, maybe it will, but we're not making the progress that we were. Um, you know, the Gardner bill theoretically met with Trump. Trump was supportive. By the next day, he forgot about it. Um, so I don't, I don't see a major 280E fix um, absent change in the House or Senate. Um, 
unfortunately. But the 280E in banking are a major problem. Um, and it's, you know, most clients that we talk to who are looking to invest in the industry, we're telling them now that they need to expect not to make any money, cash flow, for three to four years. Because if you think that you're going to open a cultivation center or a dispensary and start printing cash, and you correctly report 280E and you pay the federal government 70, 80 percent of it, you're not going to have a lot to take home at the end of the day. The real investment is investing in licenses, staying in business for the next three to four years, so that if and when there is federal change, uh, then you're a registered license holder. But people, we have, get a lot of calls from clients who want us to review operating agreements or review prospectus or do due diligence on cannabis deals for them. And they want us to do it in five days because they're going to make an investment and they're going to make 10 times their money next year. And that's just not happening. So for all those reasons, the limitation on capital, the no financing, the fact that you have to have three or four years of money in the bank to get through the next um, three or four years, it's a very difficult market. I think there's a lot of opportunity, but I also think there are a lot of people going into the industry with rose-colored glasses. So, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Um, if I seem a little um, nasal, it's because I had to do a rush. I woke up at 2.30 this morning. I was in the Bahamas where I was addressing a group of doctors from Bahamas in the Eastern Caribbean who don't know about medical cannabis, needed to know about it. Uh, they invited me to come. Then I was supposed to be here for tomorrow, and then I was asked to come in earlier. So I'm without sleep. <laughs> and at the same time, I've had a rough time in terms of trying to veer around that little girl out in the waters there, going to um, Carolinas. Anyway, having said that, um, I'm glad to be here because uh, just listening to a number of the presentations here, I feel justified in being here because uh, it was a sacrifice to come uh, in terms of the timing and all the other things I had to do. But I feel we all have a story to tell. And um, my story is going to be very different from everybody else, I believe, that you have heard here because um, uh, I've never had to introduce myself before to say who I am and what I do, and I'm going to still restrict this. But very quickly, I'm a medicinal chemist. Um, I've been involved in uh, research and development of medicinal plants for about 50 years, although you think I'm only 21. And um, I've really got a passion for um, being also an entrepreneur. And um, I, I have a health and wellness facility called Eden Gardens. Anybody who's passing through Jamaica will find that it's described as the Oasis in Kingston. And um, have, as you'll hear later, uh, a laboratory in Kingston at the University of the West Indies where we do much of the research. And then um, we have two labs over in Baltimore here, um, and um, my partner and senior scientist is here with me this afternoon, Dr. Toyong. Dr. Toyong, could you let him see? <clears throat> and he's not here because I want to demonstrate that we're reaching across the cultures in the world of Africa and Afro-America. 
but he's an outstanding scientist from the Cameroons. And, um, you know, we're, we're teaming up, and I hope I'm going to see more and more of that sort of thing happening. But this afternoon, I, I want to just um, touch on a few things because I had a more fulsome presentation and I was asked to reduce it. But my focus, I wanted to say a little bit outside of the Jamaican experience because that's really where the focus is going to be, the history and development of cannabis in the Jamaican context. Um, what I want to do then is to say something about um, how Jamaica got into this. And I'll walk you through very quickly. Now the first thing is, uh, it is said, and um, with some amount of um, truth, that the cannabis industry in Jamaica came out of uh, India. But we also know that the, during the slave trade, a lot of people don't know this, cannabis is big business in Africa too. It's been there for years, but when we speak cannabis, we only think about, uh, early on, we only think about Latin America and the Caribbean, and Jamaica, of course, and so it goes on. But those, those are the historical facts. And then we know about um, Bob Marley and the Rastafarians in Jamaica and what they did. And it must not be taken lightly. These people developed a culture through music and um, their lifestyle and religion to help to bring some recognition to, to this. Now, um, going on from there, we, we see here that um, the medicinal chemistry or cannabis research in Jamaica didn't start overnight. In fact, the work started in Jamaica from 1969. And I want to make it clear here that Little Jamaica defied um, all the authorities who wanted to suppress it. And the work actually started, serious research started from, nine, from the 1960s. Not much, but the big breakthrough came in 1972 when um, the first commercial product for the use of cannabis, a product called Canasol for uh, glaucoma, was developed by myself and a team of two others, and that really set the stage. So Jamaica is not in this business of medicinal cannabis today. It goes way back, maybe before anybody else, any other country and group. OK, going on from there, how did we get there? What did we do? Um, we did this on a scientific basis because I'm one of those persons who believe that what is the big, the big one of the big deterrents to um, medical cannabis moving forward is that a lot of things are built around anecdotes and individual experience, many of them true and factual, but the scientific basis of anything called a medicine has to be recognized. And um, we therefore started out with the Biotech R&D Institute, which is at the top right there. And this is where it's based on the university campus in, uh, in Kingston, University of the West Indies. And that was the base of where much of the research and the products you're going to see evolved from. And then we had Medicanja, which is the... Uh, uh, company that actually is responsible for the production of the uh, things that you're going to see later on um, coming from cannabis, the products. And then uh, Dr. Toyong, who is in charge of Flavor Cure and Lotharia, the two um, biotech companies in the United States. Um, the Flavor Cure is focused on oncology products. And you'll hear a little bit more about our success there. And Lotharia, which is into things like uh, neurodegenerative diseases and so on. So in other words, what I'm saying here, we have set the stage. We have taken a different line to the cannabis thing. It's no longer about extracts and um, smoking and uh, raw herbs, because 
in the world of today and moving forward, the only sustainable thing is going to be based on science and clinical work. Now, um, let me just say something very quickly about flavor cure. As I said, uh, much of the work there um, has been centered around um, the oncology. <clears throat> and so far, we have been successful in getting, and I say it very proudly, the first drug product to have orphan drug status with the FDA. And we say it also even more proudly because it's the first developing black country and a group of black scientists who have been able to achieve that. And we are doing other work on things like um, glioblastoma, which is brain cancer. And um, we have another major project that we are working with Harvard University. And you know, we're, we're trying at the same time, not with any racial prejudice, but unless uh, people of color are brought together and learn to cooperate and work together to, to achieve the big goals, the big ones, because the drug industry, the pharmaceutical industry, is not really built around people like us. And we have to make a difference and demonstrate that we can do it. So we went searching for partners at Harvard where they have advanced technology. And they, we found partners and um, where they are working on the, a new delivery, um, cutting edge science technology to deliver our drugs, which we developed from cannabis, directly to the site of the, where the cancer is. So you wouldn't have side effects and the potency of the drug would be there. You're going to hear a lot more about this later. Now, um, we have got a number of patents because, as you know, again, in this business of pharmaceutical research and development, <laughs> patents is what sells. That's what's important. And we are working on that. And um, in, the, you, in the next slide, you'll see that we have a lot of information there about the um, AML, which is the leukemia drug that we got the uh, orphan drug recognition for, and I'll just show you here um, the business of pancreatic cancer, how dreadful that is, and I don't know if many of us know that after diagnosis on average you're only around for a maximum of three months, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing. So we feel that where we are now, we might be the first group of scientists to have this drug for pancreatic cancer. Now, we have been also operating at another level because drug research and development doesn't happen overnight. It takes time and a lot of money. And by the way, if anybody is interested in investing in us and with us, we are willing to talk to you. But let's talk a little bit about Medicanger. Medicanger is responsible for making cosmeceuticals, and for those of us who don't know, as the word cosmetics come across, that's a, uh, mainly skincare products, um, which can be used therapeutically. And then, of course, we have nutraceuticals, which would be um, the products that you would consume, and also that you'd put in the body directly through, through, through um, the nostrils or inhaled in, into the lungs and so on. So we have a number of these products. And um, going on from there, you'll see there that we are saying that uh, over the last few years, we have been researching and developing these products. We have got 12 products which have been um, authorized and approved by the Jamaican Ministry of Health, which means that it can get what is called a certificate of free sale so it can be exported. And again, this is history because we are the first 
developing country, in fact, country to have had so many products approved, and you're going to see some of the products there and see their impacts. Now, um, the first six that we worked on were painkillers, because pain has been, pain management has been the most recognized um, function of cannabis. And it is well established, so no question about that. So our job was then to identify the products which could be used and deliver mechanisms and their different roles. So this first one, Relivium Spray, um, is, um, and just deal, explaining this a little bit more, that like the Relivium Spray would basically be used for hard to reach areas, like on your back where you can't rub it in and there's no lady for the men to rub it in and the other way around. You just spray it on and it sticks there and give you the relief. And then you have Relivium Cream as the next one. What's this Relivium Cream is special? Because it is used basically with or for diabetics. Because after you become um, a chronic diabetes sufferer, the skin begins to harden and you also begin to get pains in the uh, extremities and burning pains, intensely burning pains. Now, we have done the work on it and demonstrated that it works and works excellently. And it gives pliability to the skin so that uh, it, it does a double job there. Then we come to Kanjakal. Um, if there's anybody from the islands in here, you may recall um, Lima Call coming from Guyana that they have done for many, many years. Now we have improved on that um, product and we have put our um, cannabis product in there so you can splash on, smell good, and feel good. Now the next one, Kanja Rub, uh, at the bottom there, is the top seller. It is the one that everybody wants because it's like a healing oil. You rub it on and in exactly two to three minutes the pain goes. So that is the big one. And then of course we have the Tivasat which is the oral mucosal spray and it does a lot especially for menstrual cramps and um, nausea, vomiting and so on. But the one which is of greatest interest to many persons is this one called Somnican, or One Drop. Some of us who know about Bob Marley know the song One Drop. And that one is amazing because it doesn't get you high. All it does is to make you mellow. If you get home and the children are bothering you or your husband come in late rather than fight, you just take One Drop, One Drop and everything is well. <laughs> and then, of course, recently, we developed another group of six products. Uh, so those first ones were the painkillers. This, this one now, we have Epilec Pro, and I don't know if many of us know about that product that was recently approved by the FDA for GW Pharmaceutical. This is our version of it, at half the price. All right, and then we have Chloricon. Um, and again, GW Pharmaceuticals went into developing a, a drug for multiple sclerosis. Uh, we have got the equivalent of that too. Different formulation, different strains of plants. So we are going to be uh, getting these registered in the same way as them. And then um, the next one is ICON. Now, I, I made reference earlier to the fact that a team of us from the 70s was able to um, get the eye drop for glaucoma. And this has been around for all that time. But what is interesting is that it is basically not being used as much as it used to. And, um, there's been a, a lot of pirating of the product and people renaming it. 
So we did some innovation, which is part of our constant effort, and we came up with a new product, which is sublingual. I don't know if many of us know, but it should be obvious that when you drop, when you put things in your eyes, like the eye drop, 70 to 80% of it runs out and you lose it. While this sublingual product called I, I Can, and it's not EYE, when you say it, it gives you what it is, is I Cannabis. So it's I, capital I, and Can. This product, I Can, um, is used sublingually. Drop it, put some two or one or two drops under your tongue, and it gives you the same effect as putting it in your eye, and it goes, it gives you a faster relief. So that's a major innovation. And then, of course, we have Can Repel. Now, if you are in the tropics, and in fact, even in North America and here, I mean here in Canada, mosquitoes are major problems and sunflies. We have developed a new product called um, can repel, as I said, and what it does, it keeps off the mosquitoes, but if should, they should bite you before or after the product keeping them off goes, you do not get the heavy swelling and itching and burning. It's a new product and nobody else has got this in the world. And then finally, we have the CBD oils, which everybody knows about. That. That's the um, healing equivalent major component in the um, cannabis plants. Now, going on from there, um, I, I have this title called Resetting the Mindset on, on Cannabis. And the, the whole point about this is that, as I said earlier, we cannot continue to um, talk about uh, cannabis and how good it is unless we have clinical trials, because it won't be accepted globally without that. So what we have been doing then is to develop clinical trials. And one of these that we are going to start working on next month is palliative care. You know, a lot of people at end of life um, have, have got this problem and uh, they, they have to be treated. And then we have uh, work to look at uh, cancers and so on. I'm running out of time, so I'll have to speed up. Uh, there's a book here called Medical Cannabis A Way Forward for Healthcare Practitioners. It's something I would recommend, not only is it for healthcare practitioners, but for the layman, because it tells you exactly all the medical issues that you need to have addressed. And then, what I want to leave with you here are these 10 special things you should know about medical cannabis. And this is for politicians, um, researchers, everybody in there. Um, and I'm going to just touch on them quickly. Uh, in fact, the key ones you can read for yourself. Um, and the first thing is not all cannabis product, products produce a high. None of the products that I have gone through before gives you a high. Uh, and it all depends on research development and formulation. The next key one I want to mention here, and you have heard it said, we're in a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, we also want to say here that doctors and other uh, healthcare professionals need to be trained. We have done this in Jamaica. We have trained over 160 doctors. And um, we have uh, finally want to mention here that the World Health Organization, which is big news, but yet not made big news. I don't know how many of us in here know that uh, in the, towards the end of June, the World Health Organization moved the products, CBD, from Schedule 4, sorry, 1 to 4. And it means, therefore, that the world will now be able to use this without the prejudices and the issues which are there. But very few people know about this. I don't know why it's being kept secret. So I want to leave it there and say to you all that we're in a on a journey, and it's an exciting journey, and we all must try to make the journey lead us to the site where we want to go. Thank you.
which determines, they're the ones who put in the rules with all the nations of the world. So they did it now, so it's gonna be changed. I'm really amazed that so few people know about this. It's big, I have a copy of the letter. Well, we're waiting on pledges to make a... I can't speak about US politics, you know, that's heavy stuff. <laughs> Well, thank you again for that wonderful question. One of the things that um, at the end, which was expected, is that you will have more in-depth and engaging um, and more Q&A with everyone who is here today. So if you, if you know, these are great questions and you deserve to have quality answers. And so when we're finished with this brief presentation, uh, please speak to everybody that you saw today. We're gonna to have one last final component to this, which is the medical component. Um, and we're going to transition these wonderful presenters and transition in some new ones, and then we're gonna wrap up. And we're gonna have Q&A, and hopefully you make some positive business connections. Hopefully you've learned things that you'll be able to take back to your respective states and begin to act in terms of advocacy and policy and begin to, which my slogan for all of this is about changing minds and changing a culture. Because without doing those things, we're not gonna be able to get people where we need them to be around this plant. So thank you all very, very much. And we're going to have Dr. Macias come and introduce the next um, medicinal presenters. So this is an exciting point. As a cell biologist studying cancer for most of my career and then bridging off in infectious diseases um, and including malaria in Ethiopia for a course of um, seven different years, um, training medical students, PhDs. When we talk about the science um, behind cannabis, this um, next group is very exciting. We have Dr. Um, Janice Knox with the American Cannabinoid Clinics. Oh, John, where's John from New Frontier Data? Oh, there you go, John. Um, and Dr. Dari from Alera Healthcare. And Dr. Ellen Campbell Grizzle from the University um, of Technology, Jamaica. Jessica? Um, yes. Hello, everyone. I am Jessica Potts. That is my real name. <laughs> and I am the owner of Bon Santé, which is an advocacy group and educational group for Louisiana. I'm not sure if you're aware, but Louisiana just became a legal marijuana state. Um, we have... We have two um, cultivation centers that are through LSU and Southern University. Plants have not been planted yet. Um, they're in the process of that. And uh, we, we are now enrolling doctors into the program. But a barrier for our physicians and our patients is the education component. So as an educator, this is what I do. And I wanted to start by saying, telling my personal story of surviving modern health care with cannabis. So I thought it was a little catchy title. <laughs> so in, when I was 21, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I was a happy 21-year-old. I don't, I don't think I slept any in college. I had a great time and I was working until I went into work and my coworker said, it looks like you're having a stroke in your face. Um, they thought I did have a stroke. A year later, they, after two spinal taps, uh, they diagnosed me with multiple sclerosis and that's my brain and the little white spots are, um, that's actual brain damage. They call them plaques. And that is from my immune system attacking my brain. So, 
what does a 21 year old do with this diagnosis? And they tell me that I'll be retired, I'll be on disability by the time I'm 40. Um, after I cried, <laughs> uh, they gave me my treatment options. They recently introduced pills. At the time when I was diagnosed, it was self-injections only. Uh, if, and that was just to stop disease progression. If I had an exacerbation or a flare-up, it was straight solumedrol, which is steroids intravenous, five days at least. Um, if you know, it, know anything about steroids, it causes facial mooning, they call it, hair loss, extreme weight gain, anxiety, depression, and it also eats away at your bones. So here's a, the very short list of side effects of MS, sleep disturbances, weight gain, depression, anxiety, pain, high infection risk, flu-like symptoms, injection site reactions, nausea, vomiting, birth defects, I was on one that I was told I couldn't have children two years after taking the medication or my child would have a birth defect, um, organ failure or PML, which is a virus that gets in your brain and it has a 90% mortality rate. So, I'm bearing my soul to you all. <clears throat> this, uh, these are some of my medicines. That top is my injections that I had to take three days a week. That's one drawer of pills. That's the next drawer of pills. And there are my fentanyl patches. So, after 14 years of steroids,